Good morning, everybody. Welcome to King's Christian Centre here in Mould on this Easter Sunday. Uh, I can look you straight in the eye and say, He is risen. Jesus is alive. And we give thanks to God that He raised Jesus from the dead. And uh, in raising Him from the dead has made a whole new chapter in history for so many, many people. So um, it's great to, to be with you today and to celebrate this amazing day, uh, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's, a, it's an awesome day indeed. And, uh, and of course, the Bible tells us it's an awesome day because I want to read to you from John chapter 20, if that's okay, from verse 1. And it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Well, Jesus has risen from the dead. Good Friday has changed to uh, Easter Sunday. There's a a very famous uh, uh, sermon um, by an American uh, guy who says, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's uh, it's worth checking out on YouTube. Have a look. It's really funny. I I, I really enjoyed it. It was great. Well, he's risen. Hallelujah. If the death of Jesus on the cross, as we remembered on Good Friday, was the end of the unfolding salvation narrative, well, we wouldn't really have any special story to tell, would we? Just the death of a man who claimed to be somebody special. If that's all there was, then all of this is in vain. The resurrection of Jesus, then, is a seminal moment in the history of the world. Because Jesus bursts out of the tomb, we can assuredly say that the process of physical death and the hopelessness of the future of humanity has been overcome, and a new future and a new destiny for all who believe in Jesus Christ is assured. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Eh? All of that stuff, all of that things that people have lived for outside of God and outside of Jesus, just worthless, hopeless. But actually, with Jesus, because he has risen from the dead, a whole new life is promised. His resurrection writes a new chapter in the salvation narrative that has never been written previously. Jesus opens a new book. Jesus begins a new chapter in the history of the world. This overcoming of death, this declaration of sin's defeat, and the crushing blow to Satan's dominance are so blatant and so absolute. So by opening the grave, Jesus declares that death is not the end of the human experience, for there is life after death. That's a massive, huge statement, one I wish we could begin to unpack and unfold, um, and maybe we will over the coming weeks. But actually, here is this uh, incredible statement that, um, that there is life after death. Now, some people say, of course, that this life is all there is. That you have to live in the moment and, and gain the maximum you can out of our however long we live. We're living longer and longer now. It, it, three score years and ten is average, so about 70 years. Can we get as much experience into that 70 years? Because this is everything. Well, the Bible debunks that, and so does Christian experience. It says that Jesus promises us life beyond the grave because he has risen from the grave. His life and his new life after his death make it clear that he's laying down a marker for all those who believe and for all those who don't believe. If you don't believe, look at the evidence. Many people, many eminent, clever people. In fact, Jonathan Edwards, probably the most brilliant mind who ever set foot on the continent of America, was at one time an 
absolute atheist, did not believe in God, did not believe anything, as he looked at the evidence that was before him, he was compelled to believe that this resurrection is true. Wow, that and so many other people, so many other eminent minds, so many other scientists, so many other political people, so many other uh, well-known people have come to the conclusion, having looked at the evidence, that the resurrection is true. Can they be wrong? <laughs> Can you afford not to explore it? Jesus, during his time on earth, makes it clear that there's a difference between those who believe and those who don't. Those who believe are welcomed in the, into the Lord's presence forever, where there is a celebration and a, and a feasting for all. However, those who, there are those who refuse to believe, and the condemnation of those who refuse to believe is devastating. They will be banished from the presence of the Lord and condemned to a place of eternal torment. Of course, the precise opposite of those who are in the presence of God. The issue of sin has been completely sorted as Jesus, whom the Bible reveals as the sinless one, exits the grave as the first one to be saved from the eternal torment of sin's destiny because he was sinless. The Bible says that all who trust in him for their salvation will be covered by his sacrifice when we are judged. And so, just like Jesus, we will live forever. The power of sin is forever broken and the bondage of sin has been relieved as we place our trust in the most amazing and decisive act in history. You see, Jesus has also conquered the enemy of our souls. The enemy of our souls, his name is Satan, and he seeks to ruin and destroy and corrupt anything that is good, wholesome and true. He's horrible, evil, despicable. He is the father of lies and he ruins and destroys human hearts, human minds and human bodies. Satan believed that he had beaten Jesus when he had him killed. You can almost see in the page, in the, in the pages of the scripture, that there's this almost gratifying uh, satisfaction that Jesus was being killed. However, Christians believe, and the Bible teaches, that Satan's activity was destroyed by Jesus on the cross and that Satan's power can be broken. Hallelujah. The freedom that comes from trusting in Jesus and believing in his sacrificial death is complete and we are saved from the lostness of that tormenting eternity and instead have the promise of a life eternally with God. Well, one other aspect of the resurrection is that Jesus emerged from the tomb as a different person. His body was changed, maybe his looks were changed too. Mary certainly didn't recognise him and we understand that his body was raised as an immortal body i.e. not subject to death or ageing corruption. So Christians believe that their saviour Jesus today is alive. Not dead, not some bones, not some mausoleum, not some great statue, but Jesus is alive. He rolled the stone away, flung open the tomb, walked out into the fresh air and declared a new way to live. His life in us starts when we believe that Jesus died for us, for you and for me that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is alive forever. The path that Jesus has pioneered, the suffering of the cross, the defeat of death, sin and the devil, and his safe and glorious re-entry into heaven have a deep and profound consequence for all of us. Where Jesus has gone and the way he has traveled are the Christian expectation too. He has promised that there will be suffering and pain here on the earth as we follow and believe him. You know, I would love to tell you that if you became a Christian today, everything would be right. I can't do that, and I won't. I'm not going to tell you lies. I will tell you the truth, that it is really hard in today's world to be a Christian follower of Jesus Christ. There's often accompanying pain and sorrow and suffering. I mean, that is true for all of the world, but we're not immune from that either. And it's a hard road, because actually we are supposed to set ourselves apart as being different, kind, gentle, loving, caring. There are many people who don't follow Jesus who are just like that, but us Christians, you know, we have an extra special responsibility in the world to be like Jesus. And that then follows that because Jesus was persecuted, hated, reviled, that he suffered and that he died, 
That is some people's ex Christian experience. Some people do give up their lives because they are Christians. It's happening right now, today, this very day. People are being killed because they follow Jesus. But they will not give up. They will not recant their faith in Jesus Christ. They will not turn away. I wonder if we could possibly, in the West, begin to, begin to think about paying that kind of cost. I wonder whether we would give up and walk away or change our mind or compromise in some way. It's a big question, isn't it? Where Jesus has gone and the way he has travelled are those Christian expectations, as I've already said. He promised that there will be suffering and pain. Anyone who promises you different is a liar. However, there is the expectation of victory as we are welcomed into his presence and we spend eternity with God forever, for that's what Jesus has promised. Now, which life would you prefer? You have the freedom to choose either way. Jesus says in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What are you going to choose? We'll be looking at a series in a couple of weeks' time about the choices that we make. I think it's a really important thing. You know, do we choose to live in fear? Do we choose to believe? Do we choose to follow Jesus? And what do those choices mean? And what consequences are there going to be from those choices that we make? Can I ask you today if you will be one of the few? No, not the one of the few that flew in the Battle of Britain. That's not the few I mean. It's the few that find this narrow gate and walk this difficult road of discipleship and faith. Jesus said there'd be few that find it. Are you one of the few? Will you put your faith and trust in the sacrifice and the victory of Jesus this Easter? You see, if you do... The choices are that you, your life will be radically changed forever. You cannot stay the same. I keep saying this to so many people who ask these kind of questions. When you come to Christ, when you come to Jesus, when Jesus comes to live in you, you cannot be the same person you were before you made that choice. There's got to be some kind of change because you're being made to be more and more like Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. I wonder what you're going to choose today. You see, his resurrection has cut through the callous consciousness of our time and offers a satisfying alternative that demands a hearing, but also demands a decision. What will you decide to do? The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. I just wonder, will it be yours? You know, you can contact me or my wife Sue or any leader here at King's Christian Centre or in any Bible-believing church and you can find the way to know Jesus. But can I suggest that if you've been touched by something that's been said today, that you want to pray this prayer with me. Perhaps pray it after. I'll just leave a little gap between each line. You can say this prayer right now. Respond to Jesus in your heart. Respond to the salvation that he offers you. Don't respond to me. I can't save you, but Jesus can. Do you do that with me right now? Father God, I thank you that you sent Jesus for me. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died to take away my sin. And so I put my faith and my trust in him today. I know that he is alive forever because he rose from the grave. And I thank you, Lord, that his life is now my life as I put my faith and my trust in him. If you've prayed that prayer this morning, then please get in touch and we'd love to send you something if you don't live locally or we'd love to meet up with you and have a coffee, discuss that together. But what, in whatever circumstance you find yourself today, we send our love, our greetings and our blessings in Jesus' name to you and pray that you will have such a blessed Easter and that you will know the presence and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more.
Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world.